Welcome everybody to Service Drive Revolution International Truck Version. How's everybody doing today? How are you, Colleen? I'm wonderful, thank you. Had a nice two week break from work and videos and stuff like this, and now we're back at it. We'll get into your commitment issues in a second. Jeremy, <laughs> how are you? I'm just fantastic, you know. I'm fully recharged from my break, not sleep deprived at all. Great. And Adam? Fantastic. I did not have two weeks off. We just kept working. You know, massive 10x kept going on. Little uh, Grant Cardone reference there. Well, let me know. Let me tell you how I am. I was in the hospital. It was crazy. I was sitting there in the emergency room. There's a clown next to me. I'm like, what are you in for? He says, I feel funny. <laughs> oh. wow. Thank you. And that was Christian. Thank you. Uh, hopefully Christian will join us again a couple times and, and hack into this. So today we're going to talk about New Year's resolutions. We're going to talk about what books or, you know, anything that's inspiring us to learn and get better. And we're going to talk a little bit about parts and service. And I have, I have some questions that I would like to pose about that and, um, what what's working and what isn't and you know mindset between parts and service that will be will be a fun conversation so let's let's um start with what what we're reading um and we'll do, go ladies first colleen what are you what are you currently reading that's so nice thank you appreciate that so i'm currently reading atomic habits and atomic habits it's a book you know, in a long line of other books that I'll probably read half of and then move on to something else. But I'm trying to, I'm trying my best to get, to get through a full book and not get distracted. Basically, it's about, it's about improving yourself 1% at a time. I'm sure you guys have heard the whole story about like, if you improve by 1% every day, then by the end of the year, you know, you've improved, I think it's 37 percent overall by the time you're 90 you've improved 37 percent by the time you're 90 yeah and it can also go in the other direction if you are declining by one percent if you're not improving it can also go in that direction so i think sometimes at the end of the year people are surprised when they step on the scale and they're like oh i gained like 20 pounds because you don't see that happening throughout the year but at the end of the year when you step on the scale you realize that's kind of what's added up over the year right it's something so the, the atomic habit talks about not necessarily focusing on the habit, but focusing on the system. So what systems are you putting in place? So for example, if you say you want to read more, making sure that you put that book on your pillow every night. So it's there as a reminder or having a sticky note somewhere that says, I want to, I want to read this much every night and making sure there's always a reminder because that way you can start to build the habit on the system. If you just say, I want to have the habit, Typically it doesn't happen. You do it for a couple of nights and then it kind of falls off. And it also talks about not creating such a huge goal for yourself. So not saying, okay, I'm going to read this whole book in one night, but I'm just, I'm just going to start with a page. I'm just going to read one page and make that commitment. And as slowly as you follow that system, it then becomes a habit. So pretty interesting. I'm only just into the beginning of it, but so far it seems, seems like it's going to be valuable. It's a great book. That makes sense. I do. Um, and this is not a joke, just in case anybody was wondering, but I actually really like that book too. So when it comes to working out, what I did with that is I wanted to make sure that I did it every single day. So my little atomic habit was, is at five o'clock every day, I take my watch off. Um, and that was like the thing that sparked me to go exercise afterwards. And now I've actually hacked it even more to where now I stopped wearing a watch because I'm always in, in workout mode. So it's kind of cool how it kind of progresses. You start with a little habit and then it'll grow, but like you don't miss yeah. a beat if you start with that little habit. I remember the example you talked about in the book was about the way that the uh, changing shoes, um, mm -hmm. like something really little like that. I thought it was absolutely genius. The, the book is really well written and it's easy to, it's an easy formula. Yeah. In the system they talk about too, like if, okay, if you want to work out every morning, lay out your clothes. So when you wake up, you're like, oh, right. I said I was going to work out. Your clothes are already laid out. So it's not something you have to think about. So it's, it's yeah. just things like that. And then stacking habits as well. He talks about that. Yep. Hmm. Life changing. That's awesome. That's great. What about you, Adam? I'm doing uh, the five second rule or reading the five second rule by Mel uh, Robbins. And I also just kind of started that as well. 
Um, I find it almost, well, it was Audible's um, suggestion after reading The Atomic Habit. And I think it kind of coincides a lot of what you were kind of talking about, Colleen. You know, um, you know, it's when we talk about making some of those uh, incremental changes or these habits, it's also kind of derived or the book talks about or Mel talks about is these these instincts and taking action like five seconds can change basically your life in a nutshell. So if you have a decision of what she talks about a lot in the beginning of the of the book and throughout the book, I'm assuming is about hitting the snooze button. How many times do people keep hitting the snooze button for when they wake up? She obviously has a preface about about her life and, and how she got into a really low part, but it all started in hitting the snooze button and not getting up early enough to start off the day and, and having those quick little decisions that would set up everything. So she uses the snooze button as an example that if she would just get up instead of hitting it three or four or, uh, you know, 15 times, those five second different changes, um, anything from as small as to going left versus right can make some of those changes. So a couple things that uh, really sticks out to me is taking action, T- having an instinct. And the more you think about it or hitting that snooze button, you can almost dismiss it instead of dismissing it, actually taking action. So if you have an idea of something, go and taking action. So I, I kind of, if you were to relate this into business or in service realm, Really kind of, you know, if we have ideas or certain things, instead of hitting the snooze button or recognizing that it's there and that, oh, it's always going to be there if, if it's whether it's organizing the shop or addressing a certain matter in the shop, you know, instead of just recognizing it's there, taking action, it doesn't have to be something massive. So if you're tying in the atomic habits, right, just a couple things that are written down and and recognize it and taking action and following that instinct of, of there's science behind the instincts as well. Um, and uh, yeah, I find it kind of quite interesting and, and not settling for just being fine. Um, and I think we've kind of talked a little bit about a lot of that, of, of that um, in particular on some of our previous shows, right? But I think always that, that constant improvement um, is crucial. And so if you were to summarize the five second rule, is it that you don't wait five seconds, you do it within five seconds so you can't procrastinate or delay it? Pretty is much. Is that the theory? Yeah. It's, it's, she goes into, and I'm just starting, and obviously the five, like there's five things for the five seconds. Um, it's five, three, two, one. So sometimes it's a little bit of patience too, and then definitely reacting. But to your point, what you just said, yeah, don't, the more you think about it for those five seconds, you're more prone to just hit the snooze button. It's actually, uh, um, I've read that book too. It's a reverse hypnotic countdown, if that makes sense. Oh, yeah. So, that's so when you put somebody into trance, counting backwards or going down the stairs, Kind of a thing. You count, yep. You count five, four, three, two, one. So just for instance, and the other cool thing, Adam, is I think you started to catch on to that. She uses the snooze button as a metaphor for life almost. Um, so it kind of transcends into everything. Genius. Like it, uh, which I thought was really, really, really smart. Um, so I actually, I, I was definitely a, um, a person that liked to hit the snooze button in the morning. And after reading that book, the thing that I actually trans- transferred that into is doing the hypnotic wake up where I, the snooze button goes off. I immediately count down from five to one. And now I use the snooze button as a timer for sections of how to get ready in the morning. So it's nine minute sections. So I'm like, okay, so the snooze button goes up. The first thing I get up, I get out of bed, I go turn the shower on. And then I do these three things. And then nine minutes later, when the snooze button goes off, I hit it again and I start phase two of the get ready process. Bro, that's a lot like how you eat. Uh, It it is. (laughs) That might confuse some people, but it's definitely in sections. What do you what do you call that? Your uh, your uh, fetish for food, or what what would you call it? It's not a disease. Um, your quirk, or what is it called? Segmented. Segmented eating. Do you know what that is, Adam? <laughs> How he no described idea. that is exactly like that. Like nine minutes. Like. Um, that's uh, we're yeah. That's so so if anybody remembers any of this, we're just gonna remember Christian segmenting eating. That's it. Oh, I got look it. At Google, I, I don't need Google to read the rest that. of the book. <laughs> Google it. So funny. Genius. That's awesome. What are you what are you reading, Jeremy? 
Uh, well, uh, I'm reading The Customer is Never Right by a guy that used to work for us, Ian Coburn. Um, basically, what it's about is it's about how to... I'm going to... Wait, can I, can I guess that the title is a trick? Yes, it is a trick. <laughs> okay. A very clever one. Anyway, it's, it's about kind of like the nut, nuts and bolts of, um, of phone skills and customer service. Like basically, if you were a starting out in a call center or you're starting to be a back parts counter person or you're starting as a service advisor and you kind of want to learn the basics of how to do uh, sales pitches, it's, this is a really good book for that. It, it gets into the weeds a little bit with it, but it does. it's a really good back, uh, piece of background information. I think he did a really good job with it. It's, a, it's informally written, so anybody can, anybody can pick it up. It's a quick read, and uh, it gives you that background information. Like If you don't have a lot of training and you work for a sales company of any kind, you can pick up this book, read it, and you'll have the backgrounds of customer service. Like Basically, you know, name repetition, active listening, kind of like trying to meet the needs of the customer as opposed to trying to get them off the phone, that kind of thing. So it's a, it's a really good book. I like it. And I think yeah, you did a good yeah. job. I wrote that down. I'll check that one out. I have um, So I'm um, almost finished with this book. Have you, have you guys ever heard of Strat4, the company Strat4? So it's, it's like the CIA for... Fortune 500 companies. They a, a lot of uh, a lot of people will allude to the idea that they're actually even more effective than the CIA because they don't have the bureaucracy of the CIA, and they're untethered in a lot of ways. But the guy who started Stratfor has written a bunch of books, and this the book that I'm reading is called the next um, the next ten years. And he, no, the next hundred years, ah, sorry, the next hundred years. So he wrote it 10 years ago now, so it's pre-Trump, but he's predicting what will happen the next hundred years, and it is mind-blowing. Mind-blowing in just how he tells you history and countries and politics and just the chapter on Mexico alone is unbelievable. Like, it's just unbelievable. Like, things that I never knew. He connects dots you never connected. The chapter on China, he basically kind of is... Everything that he predicts in that book so far is is right on. Wow. What's the name of that one again? It's called The Next Hundred Years by George Friedman. It is mind-blowing. Once you, It's one of those books that once you start it, you, like can't wait to get back to it like you i'm listening to it everywhere i go like so it's incredible like modern day notre dame or whatever or what well it's in intelligence right so he's just taking history and then the facts as they are now and kind of talking about russia the world america politics the economy all of you know all of that um so it's really fat. Like I have a much deeper understanding now of the, of the global marketplace than I, you know, I had no clue. And it makes more. It's it makes a lot more sense. But it also it it upsets you a little bit because our politics and the way that our society is going is so naive to how the world really is. Like we really are powder puffs in a lot of ways. And he points that out. Like, you know, Corona is kind of an example of that. How many people just shut down and like, you know, they're not up for the challenge and they expect everything to be perfect. And even when it, you know, pre-Corona, think about how miserable people were. Then a challenge comes and it's like, you know, instead of stepping into it, they, it's like, it's the cause of their uh, demise kind of. Like I was just, I was thinking too, like how many, how many people panicked and shut their dealerships down and then the ones that didn't and just like, it's just interesting when you read this book, it, it very much has, com you know, common sense, real world truth, which I don't, I don't think we live in a world of truth. We live in a world of who can polarize the other side the most, you know, who can tell a better story to get, get them fired up. What Jeremy? 
we live in a world of convenience is what we live in. Yeah. People yep. aren't willing yeah. to do the hard work to really look into things. They just, they just take the information that's given to them. And that's part of it. I think. Well, and the instant gratification helps drive that too. the wanting of and needing that. Right. Yeah. So it's, it's fascinating. You guys would love it. It's, um, I've had a lot of fun. I'm almost done with it and I don't want it to end, but I'm going to read some of his other books now too. That's awesome. So I'll add like that is a fifth or sixth book that I'm in the midst of. Uh, on. Awesome. We won't even suggest it to Colleen because of her commitment issues. So Colleen, at what age did your commitment issues start? <laughs> oh, when did you realize, when did you stop and go, I have commitment issues. Like what, what was that moment? How old were you? Oh, I was probably 12 and I was babysitting some kids and I realized that I never wanted to have children after that. So probably then. <laughs> and then you, then you kind of made the jump to that's a commitment issue. Like you wouldn't want to be committed to kids for life kind of a thing. Pretty much. <laughs> well, well, commitment, I can say. That's just being what honest. I like, what I like about that is, you know, better, better to know than to, you know, have kids and decide later <laughs> you don't want them. <laughs> oh no, I knew from a very young age. So I think it just kind of stemmed off of that. Did, did, did you stop did babysitting anybody... that moment? What's that? Did you stop babysitting like from that day forward? Oh yeah, I was done. They were like the worst kids. <laughs> never <ever>. again. <laughs> it, was not, it was like never babysitting and I'm never having kids. Yeah. <laughs> have you had a babysitter walk out, Jeremy? Oh no, we don't, we don't have babysitters. It's, I wouldn't put that on someone else right now. <laughs> you wouldn't want some poor 12 year old to decide they don't want kids because of your kids. Yeah. I don't want, I don't want to create any more Colleen situations. Not that I don't, <laughs> I think you're great Colleen. I just, I don't want to do that to somebody else. So new, new year's resolutions. Like I'm not a big believer in new year's resolutions, but coincidentally, I, my doctor started seeing patients again and I went in for my annual physical and I had, you know, the DEXA scan where they do your body fat and you know, all that fun stuff that they, um, that they do. And my body fat is way more than what I thought it should be. It's thir it was 31% on the DEXA scan. And so I started on my doctor's advice, I started doing this thing called My Fitness Pal, where I'm keeping track of everything I eat. And one thing that I've learned from that is how much fat and calories are in cheese and peanut butter. And like, I'm starting to look at how I eat a lot different. Like I know some of, the, some of that's maybe common sense, but when you're, when you're tracking it, it's like, we always say anything tracked, like if you track your technician's hours every day in the shop, whatever you track be, gets better just because you're shining a light on it. And so me shining a light on my eating habits, because I work out every day, that's not the issue. Um, it's definitely the food. You know, I'm, um, I'm learning a lot about that and, and adjusting so that's kind of been my new year thing that I'm doing. But I mean, I, I see it as something that would be ongoing. I don't, it's not like by February, I won't be doing it anymore. Um, lifestyle change. What about, it has to yeah. be considered a lifestyle change, not, not a diet. Yeah, I, I uh, see, I'm like, I'm keto, so I'm directly opposite. Cheese, meat, give me the fat. I love it. No, but that's kind of how I was eating, Adam, was that way, but I was eating too much fat. I lost 60, 65 pounds, so it worked. We'll see. Going on almost a year. But, yeah, no, I mean, I, hats off to you, man. I think keeping track of it is, is huge. I, there's a lot of things, you know, in keto, counting the carbs, when you start listing everything that you have, you're like, oh, man, like 200 carbs, like, wow. Then you start actually, like, dialing it down and anything else you've got. Yeah. When you start seeing what you're actually consuming, it's, it's mind blowing. So that's anything else that's relatable, right? Keep it, like you said, keeping track of it. Then you start being more aware of what's truly happening. Mm -hmm. What are your guys' resolutions? 
I'll I'll go with mine. I actually have a couple. Or I get. I was thinking three, three big ones that I'm I want to work on um, this year is reading more books, which I've already kind of started in and putting on. And Colleen, it's funny you say that uh, the book that I'm reading is actually right next to my bed, so I look at it every time I go to bed to make sure that I'm I'm actually reading. So like I I started actually. This is probably bad though. Like two or three books and staggered just within a few days. Um, but uh, I'm committed to having um, more books in enlightenment. And um, I, I think the next tier of that is try to expand my horizons on my book selection as well. Um, spending more time with the family. I, I spend a lot of time working and uh, I think, you know, a little prioritization focus, I think we, we can all do that. And I think still achieving those those goals within, uh, you know, work. Uh, I don't really like to say the whole work-life balance. I think just spending more time and having a focused approach, which relates into my third one, is uh, just organization and execution on things. So I'm just taking a slight approach. And we talk about some of the, I like to take little pieces of some of these books that that either I, I read or I listen to, and um, you can't apply, in my opinion, you can't apply every single thing that that uh, that you read or listen to. But taking a few different pieces that that I feel that I can that I need to work on or fix, or apply, that I apply to that, and that's going to be crucial in organization and execution th- this year. I, I feel like in. Uh, there's a, there's a lot of change that uh, recently, you know, within, you know, the training realm and stuff. And I think in our current environment or our new environment or whatever the heck we want to call it is definitely going to need a, more organization in order to execute. And um, yeah, that's mine. That's good. How about you, Colleen? So first I wanted to comment on what you had said about tracking. on. Hey, Col- hey Colleen, before you get into that, I have a resolution. <laughs> It's to be more safe. Did you hear about that actress that got stabbed? No. Her name was, uh, it was Reese. Reese. Gosh, what's her name? Reese. Dang it, I know the joke. No. <laughs> Are you saying Reese or Reese? 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 Yeah. Did she get stabbed with her spoon? No, it was with a knife. <laughs> I don't really get that one. That's kind of like morbid. <laughs> I don't understand. Her last name is Witherspoon. Reese Witherspoon. Uh, there's not uh, too many actresses named Reese. She was a, remember if in the movie Scream, she Reese Witherspoon got was the first person that got killed. Oh, okay. Yeah, well, all right. Kudos to Colleen for getting that, by the way. Nice work, Colleen. <laughs> yeah, thanks. Okay, one out of four ain't bad. <laughs> I was going to mention about the whole fitness style thing, because what I was going to say is once you know, once you start tracking things, you can never go back. Yep. You, you can't go mm-hmm. back. And every time you eat something that you shouldn't eat, you feel guilty about it because you know, you now know the calories and, and what you're doing to your body. So I've been doing that kind of tracking for 30 years, probably since I was in my twenties, but I started with my own Excel spreadsheet and I had the macros set up and I was actually tracking all my calories that way. I've been doing it for a million years. I actually should have invented fitness pal, but I wasn't smart enough, I guess. So yeah, that's intense. You should have. (laughs) Right. (laughs) But as far as I don't really call them resolutions, I call them more intentions. And like I said, I had stuff from last year, which one of them I one of them I did achieve, so I might take that one out. But increasing my savings and uh, minimizing spending, unnecessary spending. I love to shop. I uh, have a huge wardrobe which I can't even wear, and who knows if when I'm going to be able to wear it because of everything that's going on. But I went through my closet the other day, and I have forty dresses, forty. And if you think about at a hundred bucks a piece, that's like four grand, and that doesn't include all the skirts, jackets, and tops and shoes on top of that. So Think about, you know, do I really need another black dress or do I really need that black skirt? You know, so I'm really trying to be focused on didn't go well last year. So <laughs> I'm going to try it again this year because I really do want to try to just set money aside. Not that I don't have savings. I do. But I think it's really important to not be focused on um, the instant gratification. 
that Adam was talking about. Like I see something and then I'm like, I like that. So I'm going to buy it because I can. And that doesn't mean that I should. So that that's one that I'm really focused on. Um, obviously, again, watching less TV and reading more, that didn't happen last year either. Maybe just because of everything that was going on. And it's it's much easier. Or your, commi- or your commitment issues. It could be. It could be. That's <laughs> part of it. But I think it's easier to zone out in front of a, a the TV than it is to actually put your mind into a, a book. So I, I think that's that's one of the things I'm going to focus on. The one thing that I did do was focus on my health and out and weeding out unhealthy habits. Cause I've always been fairly healthy, but I did go through a plan with my sister. She had a, a plan, an eating plan that I went through and actually ended up losing about 16 pounds and just became more healthy and just felt more healthy. Like the workout part has always been a part of my life since I've been young. So that's not an issue, but the eating, like you were saying, Chris, you work out all the time, but it's 80, 20. So if you're eating poorly, it doesn't matter. You can't outrun a bad diet is what they say. Yeah. So you work out as much as you want. If you're not eating properly, you're not going to see the results. So, um, mm-hmm. those are the three that I'm okay. And I had another one of honoring my boundaries. Cause I, I find that sometimes I don't honor my boundaries and give into things that I shouldn't. So that was one of the other ones, which I did respect last year. So two out of four is not bad. So we'll go with the reading more and increasing yeah. savings. The boundaries one, that's a, that's a good one. How about you, Jeremy? Uh, mostly mine centered around um, being more organized. Like I, with running a campaign, my job being the way it is and, you know, being a dad, there's like a lot of different things that are going on at any given time. And I keep running out and I keep forgetting about things that are happening or I'm losing track of progress. So basically what I did was I set my whole campaign up as a project, essentially, because that's what I am. I'm a project manager. So I break this huge task into smaller things, deadlines, specific things that intervals that I need to uh, to meet within certain times. And I've been working on that. Plus, I have uh, all my campaign events in one calendar, all my work events in a different calendar and all my like stuff that I need to do today is on a whiteboard right in front of me. So. I'm just trying to keep everything separated, but still in my still in my uh, my sight, so that I can keep it all in front of me. Because in the end, I don't want to be distracted with you know campaign stuff or work stuff when I'm with my family, and when I'm doing any of these of those other things, I need to be focused on those things. So that or being organized and seeing measurable progress is um, is one of the big the big things I need to focus on. Because Lots of big things happening at the same time. Yeah, that's awesome. So I, I have a question, Colleen, about parts and service. And one thing that I understand is that oftentimes for a parts manager, the service department's 30 or 40% of their business. And the majority of their business is, is outside. But why when somebody calls in for a price on a part and to check availability, do we not on the parts counter ask where they're having it installed? Why do we not open the door, the opportunity to transfer it and get it done in the shop? I, ha- I have a little rant on this whole deal. Um, and uh, I think that it's really important. First, I want to also mirror Colleen about the shopping thing in 2020. I actually got a thank you note from Jeff Bezos saying, I appreciate the yacht. I don't know what he meant by that, but. Um, <laughs> and you also have too many dresses, Christian, or what? <laughs> yeah, and I, I typically go with the sparkly blue, not the black ones, but I respect Colleen's uh, um, style, so that's all right. Thank you. But I think that's it's a mental those... image. Ugh. Yeah, you you opened the door on that, brother. <laughs> that was all you. Uh, but seriously, how often are we leaving dollars on, on the counter? Um, it's not just in the, in the part part of it, but, you know, just asking one or two extra questions, how much better can we have our customer experience when you think about it from the perspective of a part, right? So, uh, you know, if we're selling a radiator hose on a truck and we just quote one instead of quoting them all, or we quote, uh, hoses and no clamps, or we quote, quote, radiator and no coolant and AC compressor with no pag oil. And, and then just asking that one question about like, 
where are you having this work done? And we've talked a lot about, you know, what the future and the changes that are coming in the industry. And, and I think the way that we solidify the truck dealerships is to having a really, really solid fixed operations team. Right. And I think that that's the thing is parts and service have to recognize that they're in this together and how much business can we pull from the over the counter client coming in and buying a water pump and saying, Hey, I just want to let you know, I've got a, a fully certified technician in the back and we can get this thing turned around for you really quickly. Because in some cases, these people are going back and they're doing things in the yard, right? Like it's not convenient. They're not out on the road because they're doing repairs and stuff like that. We can increase uptime by giving them the value of our service departments. And it's just an afterthought for us, but ancillary sales and actually just asking the question of, Hey, who's going to be doing this work for you? We could really open up the opportunity and just let people know that we're also a service center. What do you think, Colleen? I, I really think it comes down to communication between the two departments and it comes down to training. So if you have a parts and service manager that don't talk or don't get along, then, and they're, they have that adversarial relationship like we know that they have, there, there really is no, there's no effort on the parts person to ask about the service side of the business. They don't care. All they're worried about is making their part sale. They don't really understand how they can affect the company and, and help overall by getting that person to go and get it, it installed in the shop. That, that's not, again, it comes down to a training. They're not trained that way. They're trained to get the sale over the counter. Just get the part sale. Don't worry about anything else. Just get, get the sale. They're not even trained to ask questions about what else can I get you? It's just, what do you want? Okay, here you go out the door so they can serve the next customer. They're not concerned about service. So it's that piece. It's also probably what's happened in the past is the parts guy's been burned by the service department and it was never resolved. So he sent a customer to get something installed and something fell apart. It didn't work out. Nobody addressed the issue because the parts and service manager weren't communicating. It didn't say, okay, hey, let's go to this customer and fix this together. So we, we're going as a united front. And the parts guy's like, I'm not sending someone to service. And I've heard this training when we've been out, when we, because we do coach them to ask that question when they're on the phone. Are you, do you need to get this part installed? Uh, let me put you through to the service department. They're like, oh, no, no, I, I'm not going to talk to the service department because I did that once before and I got burned. So it, it needs to get down to the communication piece, which we've talked about before. And then the training of the staff to ask those questions. If you're not following up on the training, and saying this is what you need to be asking every time, it's not going to happen, right? It's just it's just like you trying to implement anything new in a dealership. If you don't follow up on it, it just goes by the wayside. So that that's my feeling that it's communication and, and training that are, are the reasons why we're not putting stuff through the shop. I think if you can set that up, if we can tackle that as a foundational piece, it can open up the door for everything else. Planning, strategy, right? And truly, when we talk about before working together, when I think about the customer, you know, in, in your example, Christian, a little bit earlier, and being what's being left on the table, it's not only that, it's is the opportunity to have, if the vehicle's there in for repair, are we addressing everything that's there, right? So if we're if we're going, to, we, we need to fix it in the time that it's all there. And if we don't start looking at all these different opportunities, or we talk about quick inspections or multi-point inspection, there's more opportunity for parts and service to work together. Don't forget checking availability and giving that whole package to a customer as part of the experience of availability, what the, the end road is going to be looking like as far as how long is it going to take? I have somebody that's on it. Oh yeah, don't worry about my parts. My parts guy or gal has it covered. Don't worry about they have it there, or we don't have it, but we're going to get it from another store. Having that whole communication and that whole piece helps really make a, I'd call it like a perfect scenario, right? And it's not always perfect, but I think starting, you know, Colleen, your point and those kind of communications and what happens, because on the service side, we'll say, well, parts doesn't, they don't ever have the parts, right? And and I know in some of the other, you know. Uh, videos, you know, parts hold kind of thing, all that stuff that kind of can happen. But let's be honest, I think it does start with communication, um, kind of burying the hatchet, talking about some of these things. Okay, we put that aside. How can we address the customer when they come in in an effective manner? Because all that stuff behind there from a customer experience, we don't want them ever to have to go to anyone else but ours. 
Then we start building up that clientele and they o- they only want to come to us and they don't want to go to anyone else. And that really helps the overall big branding picture, right? I think it's it's bigger than what sometimes we just think about just parts and service. It's truly, it's an overall arching thing, but we can start small. I actually was on the line with a couple of dealerships today um, and they mentioned how they're conquesting Freightliner business because they're taking care of those those all makes customers because nobody's really doing it the best right now. So if we can distinguish ourselves through service, if we can distinguish ourselves by having that communication and interdepartmentally, we can really, we can conquest not only say service, but sales. And then that's, that becomes a feeder route for your service department going into the future. Cause it's, yeah, the it's, bar is low, right? Yeah. It's eight to 10 years of part sales for every trucks you sell. If you manage to retain that customer. So. And it's right there. It's right there. Like you, I know you're saying it's only 30% of your business. That's a huge chunk of your business. It's right there. It's captive. You, you've got a captive audience. You, the customer's in your shop getting work done. Right. So, you know, why not try to get more while he's in there? Well, and you just, you just sparked something also that I was thinking about is that um, when, when they are there and you're captivating this, you don't have to spend any sort of resources or any special formula to go and find in your AOR. And it's, you can truly build that clientele and, and it's already marketing in itself. Right. And I think that's just, why, why don't we just do it a lot more? I, I like Jeremy bringing that in to people are noticing that um, we're just not doing it fast enough. Yeah. I think that, I think the right question or the right statement or goal is, 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 you're right. It's 30% of the business. We should all be asking ourselves, why can't it be 50% of the business? What is, how healthy are we as a dealership if we're conquesting half of what we sell in the service department? I think there's a, there's a missing equation there, Christian, that I I've been saying for a while. And I, I very much believe it to be true is when you have two technicians leaving for every one coming in, like I, I had a, you know, uh, the state that I'm in reach out and ask me to do a study on their technicians that they have that are union and, you know, the, the bigger fleets are going to have a harder time maintaining technicians and we are going to have home field advantage. So if we can do the maintenance and we can make it easy, they would rather pay us and build it into their cost than they would to have to try to hire and have their own fleet of technicians. We have the advantage. If we have the techs and we offer a solution, because business is all about a solution, fixing a problem. If we do those two things in the next 10 years, the, the schools that have their own techs, the fleets that have their own techs are going to go away. They're not going to be able to recruit techs. And the, the ones, the problem that they're having now is the ones that they have are so inefficient and so unproductive that, and there's such a backlog that they're pulling them out of line and sending them to us anyways. So um, the, the advantage is, is ours if we want it. Yeah, it's ours to take. Great point. We could be as busy as we want to be. But, you know, really, we want to keep them in the ecosystem, right? It's like, it's like um, I would never get rid of my iPhone. And it's not because I think the iPhone's so great. It's because all my notes and my music, I'm in there. I'm, I'm on the heroin. Like, how do, I, how do I get out? Like, I'm not going to go to Samsung now or Windows. Like, it would just be too much work. I was going to say, does, the Sam, does that make the Android a methadone thing? If iPhone is heroin. <laughs> I don't know. That's my second flat joke of the podcast. Yeah. I, I have, the thing so I'm the only Samsung. Like, <laughs> the, the heroin was a stretch to begin with. So then we're doubling down on a, on a drug we've never tried or wouldn't endorse. <laughs> so I don't know. It's funny, but um, I was regretting saying heroin. <laughs> No, don't you worry. I'll, I'll, I'll open that up. No problem. It'll be like a can. But it, yeah, but I think the, the point is there, right? Like what, that's what we want to do is more and more it's a services economy and we want to keep them in the loop. 
And when we have the techs, we have the technology, we know how to fix them, we know how to do it, and we have the parts, then the only thing is for us to just put it all together and execute. That's it. It comes down to our ability to execute and solve their problems. And I think often we see it too much from the parts point of view or for the service point of view, and we don't see it as a customer and the customer sees us as one brand. I mean, they see us as international or what I, they see. They don't even care that it's a local franchise. They don't. Oh. I've had customers tell me from time to time, it does not matter of anything on that truck besides that badge on the, on the front hood. That's it. That diamond in the front, that's it. And, and that's, that's truly how it should be. And that's what we're striving to be. Right. And I think that's why we're all here. Is it it's the experience? Don't worry about what's behind the hood. We're going to take care of you. Yeah. It's our advantage if we want it. Like the, it's, it's a huge advantage if we want it. We need to educate again and train the parts and service staff to look at it that way though, because they look at it as they're fighting against each other. They don't realize the end result is that the customer suffers. And if the customer goes away, we don't have business. So that's yeah. a really important piece, especially down at the tech slash counter person level where they just look at each other and want to kill each other because they don't like each other. For, for, I, I still don't get it. You know, even being in a parts management position and working with a service manager, I still don't get the relationship between techs and parts. Like it's a competition when we're all trying to pull towards the same goal and they need to really focus on the customer. Listen, if you, if you do something wrong or you screw around just because you want to piss off the tech, you're affecting the customer and that's our money. That's money. That's the reason why you're here and working. So that's, that's the piece where I don't think they get it hundred percent. Yeah, it's a cultural change, right? A little shift. That's why we're, we're, we're making these small, subtle movements and we practice internally, right? And then we focus outwards and, and working on that. That's why we've got the, our, our new training for this year, right? Yeah, so one that we're really, really excited about is b Between Two Fires is uh, uh, training for service and parts together. And you know, how do we bridge that gap and become stronger together? There's so much opportunity when they, when everybody starts going through the training and they start doing the exercises, their heads are going to spin. I bet you some managers just want to get, get to work because they're like, there's so much opportunity here and I'm, I'm just looking at it in the wrong way. Cause it's, it's just mindset is all it is. Yep. I'm excited to see the, the chemistry between the parts manager and the service manager truly um, working together. I think that's huge. Yeah. And I, I think, um, 99% of parts managers and 99% of service managers come to work every day with the, you know, the want to do the right thing. I just, I think we, we have to give them the tools and the insight and the information, you know, it's good. Well, this was fun. You guys, thank you. I had a good time. Uh, next next time we'll dig more into your commitment issues, Colleen. <laughs> um, you know, all the way back at 12, that's a lot of unpacking we got to do. So we'll go through high school, college. We'll work through all of it. I love it. Um, Adam, I, don't go too crazy. What, what do you have, five books going right now? Yeah, now I've got a couple more i got to add. Yeah. I would, I would highly the recommend The Next 100 Years by George Friedman. You guys will love it. It's great stuff. Um, awesome. Thanks, you guys. Thank you. Have a good one, everybody. It's crazy. People are crazy. My phone is still broken. Are you serious? Um, are you customer service? I'm done for. Ken's been all over me about my reviews. Joe, this is your last warning. I can't have any more of this. I need to figure something out, dude. I don't know what I'm doing wrong.